and we fired off the 51, taxied out, and took off, flew down to our base, and pulled around, got a, a, a few dog fights with each other on the way down, landed, and took off the next morning, flew to Leipzig, Germany, on our first mission. And that's the kind of training we got. But when you realize that each one of the pilots had a minimum of 500 hours of, of very intense training, then you realize by the summer of 44, we had pretty well decimated the cream of the Luftwaffe, especially the uh, 190s, which were the best of the fighters at that time. And uh, to give you a feel, each squadron that went into combat in our fighter group, the 357th fighter group, we had three squadron. Each squadron had 30 pilots. And uh, normally on a mission, we flew 16 airplanes in a squadron. And uh, as I met, and I may say, that the first year that we were in combat, we shot down 531 German fighters. We lost a few pilots doing it. In fact, about oh, more than half of our pilots uh, didn't end up alive at the end of the war, but that's, that's the, way, the way a war goes, and uh, the odds were pretty good. But by the summer of 1944, we were getting into some pretty heavy combat with some smart pilots, and one of the tactics that most of the German fighter pilots that would use, and we would do the same thing, is that when you got on the tail of a 109 or 190, you'd usually end up in a tight spiral vertical dive going wide open. And uh, you'd pull the airplane end to about four G's or four and a half G's, and when you went through four and a half G's, then you'd begin to gray out. And uh, you'd lose your peripheral vision first if you held four and a half G's. Uh, much longer than you couldn't see. You could feel to fly the airplane, and if you held a little higher G, then you would become unconscious, and then you relax, and then get the pressure back. And what was happening physiologically is, was it under high Gs, and you here sitting in your chair, we call, you have one pull of gravity on you right now. Well, centrifugal force in a fighter, uh, when you pull two Gs, it means you have two pulls of gravity on you, three Gs and four Gs and the like. But what happens when you get up to about four Gs is that the blood becomes so heavy that your blood vessels in the lower extremities of your body expand because of the blood is extremely heavy. And as it expands, it drains it away from the heart. The heart it can't pump it up your head bone anymore. And the first thing it goes because of lack of oxygen on your brain is your peripheral vision. And we knew this, the German pilots knew this, because always in dogfights, once you got into about a 4G spiral, you would be trying to pull a lead on the guy since you've got to shoot way in front of him, as all of you duck hunters know. And uh, as you go through about four, four and a half Gs, the guy would knew that you were know that you were blacking out, so he'd reverse the turn. And you keep on cranking down and finally have enough sense to let up and look around, you couldn't find a guy. And he would have gone someplace else. And we uh, learned this technique also. But to defeat that disadvantage that we had when we were tracking the German fighters, they came out with a G-suit. And they brought two G-suits in the summer of 1944 to our squadron to test. And the theory was that, that if you could you know, squeeze the pilot below the waist real hard, and hold the blood up to his heart, then it would keep on pumping at higher G level. And uh, the first G-suit that we got was an air suit. And it was just like wearing chaps or just like in your trousers. You had an air bladder over your stomach, over your thighs, and over the calves of your legs. And this air bladder was hooked to a hose, was hooked to an air compressor tied to your engine. And when you pull more than about two and a half Gs, then this valve would open up and let that air pressure in and blow the bladders up. It just really hold the blood up to your heart. And you could pull about five and a half or six Gs before you begin to gray out. And uh, this helped a great deal. But the funny G-suit that the Canadians brought us, and we gave it a fair shake, uh, they, it was made out of water, and it, or rather worked on a theory of water. And uh, you, you wore a suit shaped like chest waders, and it was double wall, and you put it on next to your skin and put your flying suit on over it, and your leather jacket and scarf from May West, and, and your parachute. And the theory was behind this water suit, it was that if you could immerse your pilot in water, water having the same specific gravity is blood. When you pull G's, well, of course, the water would keep your lower extremities from expanding also, and that would keep the blood up your heart and it would pump up your head bone. And uh, that's the way 
the theory was good, but the fabric that we had wasn't too good. And when you got in the cockpit of your airplane, the crew chief would bring his five gallon bag of water out, and he'd screw it in to a nipple on the top of your, your G suit, and he'd hold it up, and all this water go down and fill this double wall suit up. When it got full, he'd take it out and screw the nipple back on it. And you'd take off on a mission. And the fabric was made out of a rubberized cotton. Had we had the fabrics that are available today, it probably would have worked in theory, obviously, but the, the air suit was so much better, I don't think it would have gone very far. Anyway, after you took off on a mission after about an hour or two, especially if you pulled a few G's, the damn fabric would start stretching down around your calves and in your thighs. And pretty soon, all this two and a half gallons of water down around your ankles. This is really <laughs> Some guy's coming in on you, break into him, and it, you, you get pretty violent in the cockpit. And, and you really lay a rudder in it, sound like, you know, a couple of active people in a water, water bed. It's, it's <laughs> but, the funniest thing, after about a seven hour mission, you come back and all the water would be down around your ankle, and you lift your leg over the edge of the cockpit. Go out to the leading edge and had two drain valves. And your ankle, you open up these drain valves, sit there, and the crew chief be looking at you. And you have two streams of water going. You, you've been in the air about seven hours, you drank a lot of coffee earlier in the morning. You sort of enter into the, the spirit of the thing. <laughs>
had a sort of drunken brawl with Poncho. It was a Sunday night before where I broke a couple of ribs, and that handle is where we stuck that 10 inch piece of broomstick in order to close it with my left arm to flip it up. And uh, that's the door itself that uh, fitted on the airplane. Check out my second goose. It has, doesn't You mean you didn't break the ribs? I notice you don't shoot the real thing up there, Dick, so that's probably what you've been shooting at. Chuck, you didn't break Next slide. Ribs. You didn't break them right in the hearts like the movie said? Yeah, but not like I showed. <laughs> Okay, here's a 6,000 pound thrust engine to burn liquid oxygen and water alcohol. Each chamber put out 1,500 pounds of thrust. You could start and stop a chamber as many times as you wanted to. And it gives you a feel of the cowlings off the engine. A very reliable engine. You burn up some 300 gallons of liquid oxygen, 300 gallons of alcohol in two and a half minutes with all four chambers on. Two chambers, five minutes, one chamber, ten minutes. Next slide. got a timer on this one here. <laughs> Here's the way all flights of the X-1 started under a B-29, uh, the mothership, and the reason for that was, as I mentioned, you had uh, two and a half minutes under full power, and if you took off from the ground, which we did one time on January the 9th, 1949, just to demonstrate ground takeoff, all of the flights were launched at 25,000 feet at 240 indicated. And the way I got in the cockpit of the X-1, you can see the door on the right side of the fuselage. Uh, when I got up to around 12,000 feet, I got out and got on the ladder that in the film that the Air Force made, you saw me jumping on this ladder to get it to slide down into the slipstream because it always stuck. And Once you got the ladder down opposite the door, you slid in feet first, and then Jack Ridley climbed down that ladder with that door and hold it against it, and I'd lock it on to the inside. And then he would go on back in the, in the B-29 Bombay and raise the ladder and then we climb on up to altitude to drop. Now, the reason that I didn't take off in the cockpit of the X-1 was that the climbing speed on the B-29 was 180 miles an hour. The stalling speed on the X-1, fully loaded, was 240 indicated. So you can see, you had to have more than 240 at launch or you'd end up in a stall and spin. We figured 10,000 feet was about the minimum we wanted to get into a spin with that airplane because it would take that long to get the <coughs> tanks pressurized and fire off the rockets to fly down the spin. That's the reason we rode in the B-29 until we got up to about 10,000 feet. Then they took 29 up to around 26,000 feet, dove it above 240 at 25,000, leveled out and released and you fired off one, two, three, or four of the chambers or how many you needed to accelerate out to that speed. Okay, next slide. How high did you get to the ground? Sir? When you took off from the ground, what else? I took off from the ground with 100 seconds of fuel, broke ground in 1,200 feet, raised the gear, pulled the airplane into an M1 at 23,000 feet, 1.1 Mach. <laughs> Here's a shot uh, taken the day we broke Mach 1, and here again, I was only 24 years old. And uh, it gives you a feel for how small the airplane is, and uh, how, how small the cockpit, but the airplane was adequate. Next, next slide. The X-1 obviously didn't have any generators, hydraulic pumps, or anything that modern airplanes, or at least the, those of you who fly. This is a very good shot of, this, of the airplane taken from the left side. I like to quickly, in the nose of the airplane, in front of the cockpit, right up in front of the rudder, was a stainless steel sphere. And in that sphere, you had 5,000 pounds of nitrogen gas. And that 5,000 pounds of nitrogen gas went through a couple of dome regulators that I controlled in the cockpit, reduced it down to 1,500 pounds. The 1,500 pounds you used to raise and lower the gear and run the flaps. Then I ran it through another dome regulator, reduced it down to about 300 PSI, pressurized the liquid oxygen tank and the water alcohol tank. Then that forced the fuel and locks back to the engine at a high enough rate to give us our thrust. Then we took off the liquid oxygen tank, back to the tail, to the most important characteristic built into the X-1, I think, that existed. And that was in the leading edge, or by the leading edge of the horizontal stabilizer, built into the vertical stabilizer was a jack screw. The leading edge of the horizontal stabilizer was tied into that jack screw, and the jack screw had an air motor on the top and on the bottom. 
and through a cylinder and I could divert 100 psi of nitrogen gas and run an air motor this way or that way and change the angle of incidence of the horizontal stabilizer. That's the only way we were able to get the airplane through Mach 1. Because then we took that 100 psi back to the cockpit and ran it through an orifice and reduced it down to about 4 psi to run the gyros in the 8 ball flight indicator and the, the needle turner bank or needle and ball. And then we dumped that into the cockpit to pressurize the cockpit with. So you're sitting there in 100% nitrogen atmosphere. I tell you, OSHA wouldn't buy something like that today, but they, would have, <laughs> they, don't, they don't accomplish a hell of a lot anyway. <laughs> that's, about, that's about how simple the systems in the airplane, how simple the systems were. And so if you'll, you can turn the slide off now, and I'll run real quick through some of the characteristics that we ran into. The X1, the first buffeting set on at about 0.88 Mach number, and, and the reason it went at a high Mach number was because the wings were only about 8% thickness to cord ratio in thickness, which was the, about the thinnest wing it ever flew up until that date. The thinner the wing, the later that shock wave will set on because the less distance the air has to travel to get around it as well as by it. And our buff, first buffeting set on at about 8.8 Mach number, and a technique that I used for those of you who worked on P-80s and P-84s, the first straight wing jets, know that we learned back in 45 and 46 as, uh, as test pilots working on the, the first jet aircraft that you could take an airplane like a P-84 out to its critical Mach number where the shock wave started forming on it, you couldn't go any faster because of drag. And if you try to dive it faster, you got out of control. So, but the one thing we did find out that suddenly the buffeting that you had at 0.82 Mach number, if you slowed up to about 0.75 Mach, where it was real smooth, and pulled about 3 Gs at 75 Mach at altitude, you ran into the same buffeting there at 75 Mach number and 3 Gs that you did at 8.2 and 1 G. So knowing this, I used this technique on the X1. When I hit the Mach number that I was aiming for, say, 0.91 or 92 on that particular day, I'd roll the airplane over and pull about three G's at this 92 Mach number, which would have been the fastest we had ever been in any airplane. And uh, what I was trying to get a feel for was what I would run into at a higher Mach number straight level. And it's a technique we use. And uh, we, this worked fine out to 94 Mach number. At 94 Mach number, I sat there and rolled the airplane over and pull back on the control call, and nothing happened. The air controls flopped back and forth. The airplane began to fall out of the sky. So we raked off the rockets and jettisoned fuel and all the landings and the X1 was dead stick on Roger's dry lake just like the shuttle does, except we landed a little faster than they did, they do. And uh, it's really not bad dead sticking the rocket on on Roger's dry lake because you aim at the middle, if you overshoot or undershoot three or four miles, it doesn't make much difference. <laughs> <laughs> it's a marvelous facility. <laughs> After looking at this data, it showed that our airplane had been predicted that it would either pitch up or pitch down in the region of the speed of sound. We lost our capability to control the airplane. And, and needless to say, we were getting a little apprehensive about the outcome. And old Colonel Boyd came out, the chief flight desk, and said, hey, man, we don't want no accidents out here. And I agreed with him 100%. <laughs> we, we looked at the data, and what happened, the X-1 had holes drilled in the wing about six feet out in the fuselage, as well as halfway out on the horizontal stabilizer, about every inch in the skin, and each one of those holes was hooked by a tube to a manometer recorder. And as you know, when a shock wave forms on a wing, the air in front of that shock wave is supersonic, behind it is subsonic because it compresses, it slows down. And that static pressure in those tubes, that air going over, obviously, the higher the velocity in front of the shock wave, you have less static pressure. Behind that shock wave, the lower the velocity, you have a higher pressure. So we, we could trace that shock wave, which had formed on the wing as well as on the tail. And it would began moving back as soon as it formed, as we increased our speed. And at 0.94 Mach number, it was at the hinge point of the elevator on the horizontal stabilizer. And we lost our elevator effectiveness. And then, of course, we had never used that jack screw with the air motors on the top and bottom to, bottom to change the angle of distance of the horizontal stabilizer. And then uh, we looked at it, start checking, put a bunch of three and one oil on it, checking it out on the ground, and got it to working in a try to flight. 
just by using the horizontal stabilizer. I could control it in increments of about a quarter degree up and down. And I took the airplane up to about 49 Mach number where the elevator effectiveness made a change leading edge down the airplane pulled about 3 G's. I retrimmed it, accelerated on up to 0.94 where we lost the elevator effectiveness and the thing had exactly the same effectiveness that it had at 0.9 and from then on out it was a piece of cake. In fact, about two more flights we got our first mock jump. The airplane was sitting there at about 9.6 or 9.65 indicated a Mach meter only went to 1.0. I don't think they had a hell of a lot of confidence in this. <laughs> anyway, it was in increments of 1%, 0 0.9, 0 0.92, 93, on up to 1.0. It was sitting there at about 965 indicated, and the needle fluctuated and went off the scale. When it went off the scale, then all the buffeting quit. We had supersonic flow with the whole airplane. I got some elevator effectiveness back, but the airplane uh, flew very nice, except it was very stable. And that was our first uh, first supersonic flight. We did make a tremendous sonic boom there at uh, Edwards, and we didn't really know what we were getting into, but that's the way it worked out. And uh, as I mentioned, the flying tail technique was, in my opinion, the most important thing that came out of the whole X-1 program because we slapped a, a classified the whole X-1 program after we got above Mach 1. And really, in the Ray Hausman series, remembered way back when we were having a lot of trouble trying to keep classified data from the press. Uh, and it, it hadn't changed an awful lot today either. But, uh, <laughs> knowing we released the fact that the X-1 had flown at supersonic speeds about nine months after it happened, it was a marvelous thing because it got the press off of our back and it took five years before the rest of the world found out that you needed a flying tail on an airplane to operate in the region of the speed of sound. And it took, like the MiG-15 was in use in 51 and 2 and 3, uh, Hawker Hunters and French Mirages, all three of those countries, uh, Russia, Britain, and French, took them five years to find out what we found out with the X-1. And it worked out real good. And, uh, that's, that's the way R&D has paid off, and that's, that's about I think we've been here about long enough. That's about the extent of some of the interesting things. I'll cover real quick what we're doing today uh, because uh, we've gone through an evolution of the fighter aircraft. And uh, although I retired from active duty in 75, I still have a civil service job at Edwards as a consultant test pilot. And I do a lot of flying on the F-20 as a consultant test pilot because there's no military money in the F-20. I can do that without getting into a conflict of interest. Uh, and I take advantage of it. So, <laughs> when we went supersonic, started developing fighters with fluid supersonic speeds, it became very stable and because it had supersonic flow of the whole airplane. And consequently, uh, an airplane is stable is not maneuverable because maneuverability and stability run hand in glove. The more stable an airplane, the less maneuverable it is, and vice versa. So consequently, these airplanes that came along after we were able to fly at supersonic speeds, in order to make them maneuverable at supersonic speeds, we made them very unstable at speeds below the speed of sound. And this came about in our first uh, supersonic family of, uh, of fighters like the 101, 102, 104, 106, 105s, and the like. Right on up, and we've made them so unstable at subsonic speeds because that's where most of the guys do their fighting or dive bombing or air to ground work in strafing. And we had to put stability augmentation systems like pitch, yaw, and roll dampers on the airplane. And then consequently, they became so unstable so that we had a lot of maneuverability at supersonic speeds that Airplanes like the F-4 Phantom II that came out in Vietnam, uh, they were so unstable at slow speed that if you ever departed one or snapped it, the chances of recovering from a spin is practically nil. So consequently, that led here some 10 or 12 years ago to what we know now as the fly-by-wire system. And the F-16 was the first production fly-by-wire aircraft that came about. And the, way we're, the reason we went that way is we could make a fighter extremely unstable, put a large sail on it, move the center of gravity at, make it extremely unstable, which meant it's very maneuverable, and then put a computer in it and let the computer fly the airplane through a servo mechanism, 
and then programmed the computer so that it never let the airplane exceed a certain angle of attack or yaw angle or the parameters outside which it would snap. And then regardless of what the pilot calls for in the heat of battle, in angle of attack or yaw roll, the computer will never let that airplane exceed those parameters. And it makes for a pretty good system. The only problem we had with the F-16, which is the first production flight of our system, we went to analog computers in those flight control systems, and it, there's a little bit of incompatibility between the fly wire systems computer and the weapons management computer, which is all digital stuff. And consequently, that was solved when the F-18 came out and the F-20, which is a follow-on today. Now, we have straight digital systems in the F-18 and F-20, and all of the systems talk to each other through multiplex buses and the like, so that all of these systems can be brought up to the pilot and displayed to him instantaneously. And uh, airplanes like the F-20, we've done away from with instruments. And now, like in the F-20, you only have two cathode ray tubes or TV tubes, you're going to call them. And each one of these tubes have five buttons on each side. That's 20 buttons. And when a pilot flies the F-20, I sat there with some 18 functions on a stick and a throttle. And I can call up a menu of what do I have on my airplane, the way of weapon system. And every one of those buttons on the CRT will light up with an air-to-air -air missile radar, air-to-air -air missile infrared guns, dive toss, air-to-ground, surface-to-air missiles, or air-to-surface missiles, or anti-ship missiles, all of these systems that I have aboard. Then I'll run a cursor up to the one I want to use, press it, displayed on the CRT. Then I move it up on the, the, the heads-up display, and I never go back to the cockpit after that. And that's the way these systems operate. It makes a fighter pilot today about 10 times more effective than it was just three or four years ago. And the inertial navigation systems, which have been a pain in the tail in most fighters because they take anywhere from four to 15 minutes to fully alignment. And Van Osdale understand he's being an old commercial driver. It takes, in a fighter today, because you carry such exotic weapon systems in these missiles, you've got to know precisely where you are exactly in space. So it means having an inertial platform that is very accurate. And what we've done, a new breakthrough in avionics with the F-20, we've come up with ring laser inertial navigation systems where we do away with the gyros, use four mirrors and a laser beam. That's our gyro. Put it on three axes and it has an instantaneous alignment. 23 seconds, which is almost instantaneous. And those are some of the avionics breakthroughs that are becoming available because all of these things have happened just within the last three or four years. So, appreciate the opportunity to get down and keep up the good work in the Confederate Air Force. Thank you very much. Probably the best prop airplane came out of World War II, as far as I'm concerned. 
Right today, uh, probably the best fighter we've got as far as long range acquisition capability would be an F-15. Uh, the one that could probably take better care of itself than any fighter we have is probably the F-20. Probably buy? the easiest made. I, that's, uh, the Air Force is pretty well stuck with the F-16 weapon systems and they, that's about, they haven't got much choice the way it looks. The F-20 is primarily a follow-on for the F-5 for foreign military sales and most of you I'm sure watched that 20 minute or 60 minute program which is pretty well presented. But uh, there's a lot of sides to it. So. And did the fly the British Spitfire? What did you think? I uh, spit. As far as I'm concerned, yes, I flew the Spit. In fact, I fought him quite a bit in mock dog fight. The uh, Spit wouldn't do anything, and the Mustang wouldn't do for eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> the Spit would fly for an hour and a half, and that was it. Uh, it was a great defensive fighter, but the 51 came along later, and we flew eight-hour missions with the 51, and do the same thing the Spit would do except do it about a thousand miles away from England. Yes, sir. Were you guys really that wild in the high desert? <laughs> no. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, a lot of these stories get blown out of shape. Once. <laughs> yes, sir. Out of all the aircraft you flew while on active duty, what would you say? Well, like I said, it, it's according to what you want to do with it. Like, I mean, if you're hauling cow manure, you get a pickup truck. If you race, you get a race car. But uh, for the pure fun of flying, probably an F-5 uh, would be the most fun, having a couple of reliable twin engines. Uh, as far as old airplane, for an air, fun airplane today would be uh, is an F-18 or an F-20. They both have comparable systems and all fly by wire systems. Yes? Looking back on it, are you sorry you didn't get selected for the astronaut program? No, I, I didn't necessarily get, uh, see I left Edwards in 1954 and the space program didn't start until 59. I had some nine years since most of the original seven astronauts were the same age bracket as I was, except they had four years of college and started in flying late. I started flying at a very young age. Uh, also, I had a lot of fun in some interesting airplanes. The first space program of course wasn't very interesting from a pilot's viewpoint. I'm sure it was fun during the work that they did, but that's, uh, that's a matter of opinion. And I, I didn't necessarily want to get involved. I'm sure if someone walked up and said, you want to fly in a capsule, I'd say, yeah, just to see what it was like. But uh, no, I wouldn't fight to get in a program. It'd be fun to fly the shuttle today. It would be a waste of money. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily want to sit in the back with all those mission specialists barfing in their beards. <laughs> well, I think we'll be here all night. We've got a lot of work to do tomorrow. I appreciate the opportunity to get down. Thank you. He didn't want to be spamming a can, so you know. He likes to fly. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being with us. You know, uh, I would like to uh, thank General Yeager for being with us and for letting us, or for sharing with us some of his experiences. Uh, technically speaking, with the exceptions of uh, a couple of guys that I can spot out here who are blackbird types, uh, technically we're not your peers. We are your peers, however, in our hearts and in our love for flying and our love for aircraft. And we admire what you've done and we compliment you for a job well done. to Colonel Yeager, the CAF Colonel. This is one outfit that can demote generals. <laughs> Not long ago, we demoted General Howard. For a while, I was really mixed up. I called him Colonel General. <laughs> but uh, I want to speak to the CAF Colonel Yeager. Uh, we would like for you to uh, have a little uh, 
memento uh, with our wing crest on it. And uh, that's to put all that cash in you're going to get from those commercials. <laughs> <laughs> and, and while you've received all the honors that can be received in the field of aviation, we would like to bestow on you our highest honor. We wish to make you a permanent wing member of our wing. And he said, the hell we do, what is it? And I said, anchors away. Are <laughs>